welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. While we're standing, let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you tonight for the privilege in Jesus' name of gathering together. Lord, thank you for this church family. Thank you for the good work that you've begun here. And thank you for the good work that's continuing. Father, we ask that by your spirit you would minister to every life, every heart, every need. And that, Father, your word would make the difference in our lives. We thank you that that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We thank you that your word is truth and the truth sets us free. We open our hearts to receive from you and to have our lives changed and transformed according to your plan and your purpose for our lives. Thank you for it. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. Pastor Dan, thank you for all those kind words. And uh, Pastor Jim and Deborah, as always, every time that you allow me the privilege to come, I look forward to it uh, from whenever I find out about it. And uh, this is always a highlight, a treat uh, for me to be here because I just, I love the passion, I love the purpose that God put in Pastor Jim and Deborah's heart uh, when they started The Rock. Aren't you glad to be a part of it? And glad for great leaders and glad for the great team that's, that's carrying on the work. Uh, I want to share with you tonight, and, and Dan, I will mention something a little bit about the turkey trip. It'll fit in here in a little bit. Uh, my wife and I did just return uh, from leading a group to the sites of the seven churches in the nation of Turkey, the churches of the book of Revelation. And I'll share a little story from that as we get a little bit further into this message. But I, I want to share with you something that happened to me about a year and a half ago. Uh, My wife and I were ministering in the nation of Indonesia. It was our very first time to that particular nation. And uh, we were sharing in a church. And I don't know what it is. When you're overseas, you really want to do a good job and really help and bless the people. And um, Indonesia is the most populous Muslim nation in the world. And so we knew that, you know, these believers are, you know, very serious about Uh, their relationship with God and I was just wanting to give them the very best I could you know with God's help and uh, I was sharing with them just a real simple fact that everybody knows I think everybody understands this if you've been alive very long you know it and I was just talking about the fact that everybody in life faces problems how many of you know that's true not a deep revelation is it Uh, Just, you know, look at your life, look at your week, your month, whatever. Uh, Just everybody faces problems. And I was making the statement, and of course, I'm working through an interpreter. And whenever you're working through an interpreter, you're kind of at their mercy to communicate accurately what you said. And um, I, I made the statement, I said, wouldn't it be wonderful if... Now, now what when somebody says if, you understand that... It's not necessarily so, it's kind of a hypothetical. I said, wouldn't it be wonderful if at the end of this church service, I could pray a miracle prayer over every person here? And because, and I was kind of teasing about this, because of my great faith and my great anointing, uh, because of this prayer, uh, God would bless every single one of you with a trouble-free life. Because of this miracle prayer that I would pray, uh, you will never face another problem again as long as you live. Now, I said that through the interpreter. And when I got done with my statements and the interpreter got done with, you know, interpreting, the crowd went absolutely wild. They began to shout, jump, stand up, I mean, they, they were absolutely celebrating. And I realized something got lost in the translation. <laughs> because what, in essence, the interpreter said was, at the end of this service, Brother Cook is going to pray a miracle prayer over this entire congregation. 
And because of his great faith and great anointing, they didn't catch that that was a joke. Because of his great faith and great anointing, God is going to bless every single one of you with a trouble-free life. You will never face another problem again as long as you live. The crowd went berserk. And I realized one of two things is going to happen. Either I've got to correct this right now, or there's going to be a lot of people that hate me by Monday at noon. <laughs> and so I said, let me, let me back up and clarify that statement. I did not mean to say that I could pray that prayer. I said, it would be nice, wouldn't it be nice, if, and I emphasized it, if I could pray that prayer. And then everybody fell into depression. They were, they were so happy before that. And I had to go and clarify that. But you know, I, I, seriously, how many of you know there's a difference between faith and wishful thinking? And faith is always based, and should be based, true faith, genuine faith. The faith that God honors is a faith that is based on His Word. And so we can't endeavor to promise something that goes beyond the Bible. And so I said to this congregation in Indonesia, I said, let me take you to a couple of scriptures. And let me share with you something that will help us understand life and understand God. And the first scripture that I took them to, and we're going to look at it tonight, is Psalm 34 and verse 19. Psalm 34 and verse 19. And in this psalm, David says, many, everybody say many. many. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But, aren't you glad there's that word there? But the Lord delivers him out of them all. See, that verse alone communicates clearly why I cannot promise somebody that I'm going to pray for you and you're never going to have another problem again. Matter of fact, in one church service, there was a, a minister that was praying for people individually, and a person came up to him, a man came up to the minister and said, I want you to pray for me. And the minister said, well, what do you want me to pray for you about? And uh, the person said, well, I want you to pray that I'll never have another problem with the devil. And the minister said, oh, so you're wanting me to pray that you'll die. And the person said, oh, no, no, that's not... And the minister said, well, the only place you're never going to have another problem is, is in heaven. And uh, so, so we've got to have a realistic faith. Realistic faith. And, and that doesn't mean you have to be pessimistic. That doesn't mean you have to be negative or fatalistic. It just, it's, it's a true statement that many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. And I, I love you too much. I'm not going to stand up here and lie to you and tell you that if I pray some miracle kind of prayer that you're never, ever going to face another problem because the Bible tells us something different. The Bible says that even for the righteous... How many of you here are righteous tonight? And you may be looking around and say, well, how dare they say that? They're not... When, when, when a person says they're righteous, it's not boasting in ourselves. Our righteousness is based on who Jesus Christ is, and what Jesus Christ did. When you have your faith and your trust in Jesus and what he did when he died on the cross for your sins and shed his blood for you and rose from the dead, he is your righteousness. That's a gift that is given to you, not something that any of us earn or deserve because we're good or perfect or religious. That's a gift that is given to us. But even the righteous, according to Psalm 34, verse 19, will face many afflictions, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. I'd rather look at the last part of that verse and be happy rather than look at the first part and be sad. If there's an answer, if there's a solution, then I'm not going to waste my time dwelling on the problem. How about you? There's another verse in the New Testament that kind of says the same thing. And in John chapter 16, verse 33, 
This is a statement by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Jesus said, John 16, 33, These things I have spoken to you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. That just means problems, trials. In the world you will have tribulations, but, there's our word there again, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So both David in the book of Psalms and Jesus in the New Testament state that in the world we're going to face some challenges. Now how many of you would know that even if you had never read a Bible? I mean, life teaches us that. Experience teaches us that. But the revelation of God's Word says there's somebody who's bigger than your problems. The revelation of the Word of God says there's somebody with wisdom beyond what we have in our mortal brain. There's somebody with power that is more powerful than we are who is ready, willing, and able to come to our aid to our rescue, to our help. Jesus said, I've overcome the world. Now, when it comes to having realistic faith, uh, one of the verses that comes to mind to me is is a verse that Paul stated in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 18, when he was talking about something that he wanted to do. He had certain desires, and Paul... You know, he breathed and drank and ate and lived the church. Paul loved local churches. And Paul went from city to city starting churches and getting people born again and getting people to follow Jesus, be disciples of Jesus. And one of the places that he had started a church in was a city in northern Greece called Thessalonica. And he basically got run out of town. Uh, People wanted to hurt him real bad. People wanted to kill him. And so he got the church started and then he had to leave and he left some people in charge. And Paul made a really interesting statement to them in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 18. He said, therefore we, meaning Paul, we and his team, we wanted to come to you. So he had a desire. We wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. But Satan hindered us. Can I be real honest with you tonight? I don't like that verse. Do you know there's some verses in the Bible that I don't like? You ever come across any that you don't like? Be honest. There, you know, the flesh, the flesh part of, of people, you know, we just want to be comforted and all that. But, you know, the Bible sometimes will challenge us. The Bible sometimes, it, it doesn't candy coat things. It tells us the, the ugly realities of life, but then it gives us hope because of a God who's bigger than those ugly realities. You know, I know the kind of ministry that you get here, uh, and I know that Uh, you get incredible teaching and incredible preaching. And I know that the preaching will not only feed you, but will also challenge you. Somebody once said that the job of a preacher is to comfort the troubled and to trouble the comfortable. (laughs) Have, Have you ever been made to feel a little bit uncomfortable? You know, your flesh, you know, is challenged and... And so on. And and Paul said that, he said, I had this desire. I wanted to come to you time and again, but Satan hindered us. The reason I don't like that verse is simply because I know that Paul had a certain level of knowledge and revelation and insight. He had a certain level of faith. And, And I'm sitting here thinking, if Satan could hinder Paul then maybe he could hinder me. I don't want to face any hindrances in life. I want everything to happen just the way I want it. I want everything I want. I want it now. I want everybody to make me happy. I want everybody to like me. How many of you know, I mean, how many of you would like it if the world was really like that? Just everybody existed to make you happy. How many have found out 
life in like that. Everybody's interested in their own deal. Everybody, you know, the, the counterfeit trinity is me, myself, and I. The only problem is that's everybody else's counterfeit trinity too. They want us to make them happy. So, you know, we've all got that intrinsic, fleshly, selfish thing that I want what I want, when I want, how I want it, as much as I want it. You know, the, the world, the flesh is just selfish and, and that type of thing. And unless we, uh, number one, are born again by the Spirit of God, but number two, get our mind renewed to the Word and, and, and get the Holy Spirit ruling in our life instead of the flesh, then we'll, we'll just gravitate. That's why, you know, you know, there's folks that the Bible calls carnal Christians, where there's envy and strife and divisions and things like that. We don't want to be carnal Christians. We want to be ruled by the Holy Spirit so that His love uh, and, and His mercy and His kindness permeate through our life. But Paul was an individual. This was a godly desire that Paul had, but he said, but Satan hindered us. And that word hinder, if you go back and study it in the original language, it means to, to cut in front of somebody so as to slow them down, to hinder them, to impede their progress, to thwart their forward momentum. I mean, it's even the word that would be used if, if somebody's going down the road and a tree falls in front of the road and they can't get by it. Or somebody goes and digs big holes in the road so that they can't traverse that road. And Paul said, Satan hindered. And see, a lot of people come to Jesus thinking that, well, if I just give my life to Jesus, then he'll solve all my problems. Well, I want you to understand, Jesus will absolutely help us. Jesus is in us. He's greater than the world. He's overcome the world. But that doesn't mean that you get an automatic free pass to a trouble-free life. And so how do we deal with these hindrances? You know, there are people who, who face some problems in life and they give up on God. They say, God, you know, if you love me, this wouldn't have happened. And they begin to interpret the love of God in the light of circumstances in this world. Listen, I'm telling you, this world can stink bad. And it can bring all kinds of hurt and heartache into people's lives. And you cannot allow yourself to interpret God's love for you in the light of what's going on in this fallen world that we're living in. There is a God and He's greater on the inside of us than anything that this world has to offer. But this world, it will throw some garbage your way. And I want you to not have a flimsy faith based on hyper-idealism and wishful thinking. Uh, I want you to have a rough, tugged, uh, tugged, a rough, rugged, tough, resilient. I just made up a new word, Dan. Write that down. <laughs> I want you to have a tough, rugged faith that, that can, you know, face the, the realities of life and keep moving forward with God. I want to talk to you tonight about storms because storms are, can be hindrances. Storms can be some of those afflictions, some of those tribulations. Seems like all the different parts of the country have their different uh, weather problems or natural problems. You know, Southern California is known for earthquakes. I'm from Oklahoma. We are known for tornadoes. I was just in um, Florida this past weekend. You know, they get hurricanes. I'll be going to Bismarck, North Dakota in a couple of weeks, and in the wintertime they get blizzards. You know, all the different parts of the country seem to have their uh, problems that, that they can potentially face, many of them weather-related. And how many of you know there's a difference between a blizzard and a tornado? You know, like I said, my wife and I live in Oklahoma, and every once in a while, especially in the springtime, Lisa will call me and say, Tony, you know, I'll be upstairs studying or something, and she'll say, you know, you might want to come look at this on the Weather Channel. There's a tornado on the ground. It's, you know, kind of 
in our general vicinity. And, you know, never once have I said to my wife, honey, don't worry about it. I've got a snow shovel in the garage. Because <laughs> snow shovels don't do anything against tornadoes. There's different things that you do to deal with different types of storms naturally. And, and I believe that biblically and spiritually, I believe there are different kinds of storms that we face in life. And I want to talk about those storms from three Bible stories. And the first Bible story that I want to talk to you about tonight is the storm of Jonah. How many of you know who Jonah was? Jonah was a prophet in the Old Testament, a preacher. And he lived in Israel. He was a Jewish prophet. And God told him to go to a place called Nineveh. And does anybody just offhand happen to know where Nineveh uh, where it is today, where the ruins of Nineveh are located. It's, it's located in Iraq. And it was the headquarters, the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And they were bitter, bitter enemies of the Israelites. And the Israelites were bitter enemies of them. And God said, these people are very wicked... And uh, if you don't go preach to them, and if they don't repent, their wickedness is going to bring judgment on them, and they'll all be destroyed. And, and if you even remember this story, if you ever went to Sunday school as a kid, or just have read this in the Bible, when God told Jonah to go preach to the Ninevites, their bitter enemies, the Bible says that Jonah got on a ship, he got on a boat that was sailing for a place called Tarshish. You want to take a wild guess where Tarshish was? Spain. Now, if you know anything about geography, Israel is here. Nineveh was right here. It wasn't that far away. Spain was way over here. In other words, God told him to go preach to a group of people, and the bottom line is, Jonah hated those people. And when he thought that God might save them, he hated them so much, he got on a ship to sail to the farthest point known to man at that time. He, he was sailing to Spain. What do we call that? Running away works. What's another word? Disobedience. Well, Jonah gets on the boat, and see, he, didn't just, he wasn't just content to run away from God, disobey God, but he told everybody on the boat what he was doing. Listen, next time you decide to just disobey God, don't tell everybody about it. I mean, Jonah tells everybody, I'm, I'm running away from God. So this storm comes, the boat's being battered about in the Mediterranean there. And uh, all these guys remember that, hey, this Jonah guy told us that he was running away from his God. So they think, no need for all of us to die, let's just throw him overboard. <laughs> just remember who those friends of yours are that you're hanging out with. Because you'll think they're real loyal until. And they throw Jonah overboard. And the next thing you know, the Bible says that, that the Lord had prepared a great fish. Matter of fact, let's look at this. It's in the book of Jonah, chapter 2. Jonah chapter 2 and verse, uh, what is it, 16 or 17? I'm sorry, Jonah chapter 1, rather. Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. It says, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I don't know about you. Now, Pastor Jim, you're kind of a seafaring guy. You know, you're kind of a water guy. I was raised, my high school was in the middle of four cornfields in Indiana. So I wasn't a fishing guy at all. And I'll be honest with you, today I'm still not, you know, just holding fish and things like that. That's just kind of creepy to me. I, I grew up with beef, all right? You know, give me a good steak or whatever. But just, uh, 
holding a fish to me is just kind of creepy. I know you may think I'm a sissy or whatever, but it's just, that's just how it is. And, but can you imagine how gross it would be to be swallowed by a great fish? The, the smells, the textures, the juices that you're in, the gastric juices that you're in. I'm not trying to be gross. I mean, it just was. And I don't know if you ever see anything humorous in the Bible or not, but I want you to look at this. See, Jonah had an attitude. Jonah did not want to do what God wanted him to do. Jonah wanted to do what Jonah wanted to do. And he was stubborn and he was rebellious and he was running away from God and telling people about it. Now look at this again. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Three days and three nights. Look at the next verse. Then Jonah prayed. Seriously? You got to be sitting in fish gastric juices for three days and three nights before you decide to surrender to God? You talk about stubborn. But you know, Jonah goes on to pray this beautiful prayer. He consecrates himself to God. And, and the Bible says the, the Lord caused the fish to regurgitate Jonah. Which I'm sure that was a treat. <laughs> and, and the word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time and says, Arise, go to Nineveh. And Jonah said, I think I'll do it this time. But see, that's one type of storm in the Bible, a Jonah storm. And a Jonah storm is a self-inflicted storm. It's where you create your own problem. Now, listen, I didn't come here tonight to beat anybody up or condemn anybody, but, you know, isn't it just good to get set free by the truth? If, if I have created my own problem, then I just need to quit blaming everybody else for it. I need to quit blaming God. I need to quit blaming the devil. You know the devil's not, he's not omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent. He can create some problems, I understand that. But not everything in the world is caused by the devil. There are some things that we just, you know, when we're dumb, we don't even need the devil. Because <laughs> we mess our own life up. <laughs> Do you ever hear, and uh, let me give you a kind of a good him. You want a hymn to back up what I'm saying? How many of you know the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus? Do you know there's a line in What a Friend We Have in Jesus that says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. How many of you had some pain in life? We all have. Some more than others. And you know what? I think just part of life, there, there's just some pain going through life. There's just some things that hurt. And I've, I just figured out and, and, and hopefully got it, you know, in my head a, a while back that, you know, there's enough pain in life that I don't really need the needless kind of pain. Let's try to avoid that. Jonah, give me one word. Jonah got into his storm because of disobedience and he got out of his storm give me another word obedience. obedience repentance consecration prayer he repented that just means he turned away from going his way doing his thing and he turned around and said God I'm going to do it your way Jonah got into his problem his storm because of disobedience he got into his storm by repentance and you know, if we're not careful, we'll tend to think, okay, well, that answers everything. Everybody who's having a problem, it's because there's sin in their life. I knew it. Wait a minute. Remember we said there's more than one type of storm? Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. Not every storm is a hurricane. Not every storm is a tornado. Not every storm is a blizzard. Not every spiritual storm is a Jonah storm. 
not every storm that you face in life, metaphorically, is because there's sin in your life or because you're out of the will of God or you're in disobedience or because you've missed God. There's other types of storms. And in Mark chapter 4, we begin to see one of these storms, one of these other storms. And it says in Mark 4.35... Jesus had, to give you a context, Jesus had been preaching and teaching all day long. Great story called the parable of the sower. And it says in Mark 4, 35, on the same day when evening had come, he, Jesus, said to them, his disciples, let us cross over to the other side. Now, again, you need to know where he was teaching. He was teaching beside the Sea of Galilee. We would just call it a huge lake. But Jesus is teaching on the side of the lake. And he, what does he tell his disciples to do? What are his instructions? Let us do what? Let us cross over to the other side. So Jesus has given a directive. And it says in verse 36, Now when they had left the multitude, in other words, they got away from the people, they took him, his disciples took him, Jesus, they got him into the boat, took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great wind storm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling with water is the implication there. It's already filling with water. Now, let's just do a little bit of logic here, okay? Jesus says, let's cross over to the other side. So the disciples step away from the multitudes. They put Jesus in the boat, and they begin sailing to the other side. Are you with me? So I've got a question for you. Are they doing what Jesus said to do? Yes. If you're doing what Jesus says to do, are you in the will of God? Yes. So they're in the will of God, and what happens? Now, why did Jonah get into his storm? Because of disobedience. But the disciples are doing exactly what Jesus told them to do, and what happened again? Okay, I've got a theological conclusion here. You ready? A storm can happen in your life at one of two times. When you're out of the will of God or when you're in the will of God. Now, does that seem to be biblically supported? Yeah, the disciples are doing exactly what Jesus said to do and... And, and yet a great windstorm arose. The waves were beating into the boat so that it was already filling. But look at verse 38. But he, Jesus, was in the stern, the back of the boat, asleep on a pillow. Man. He was either really, really tired from preaching or he really knew how to rest in the peace of God. He's in the back of the boat asleep on a pillow and professional fishermen are panicked. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Can I tell you there's two lies from hell that you need to avoid when you're in the midst of a great storm. Lie number one is that Jesus doesn't care. Lie number two is that you're perishing. Did you ever notice how when the enemy begins to play with your mind, he always paints pictures of the worst case scenario? What counselors call catastrophic thinking. And, and that's what their belief system was. They believed Jesus didn't care and we're going down the tubes. We are perishing. You need to resist those two lies. Now, Jesus' response is very interesting. Verse 39 says, Then he, Jesus, arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. 
and there was a great calm. Jesus talked to things. He talked to the winds. He spoke to the sea. There are people in the world today that say, if you talk to things, you're crazy. I kind of take this position, if you don't talk to things, you'll go crazy. (laughs) But you need to talk the right way. Jesus exercised spiritual authority. Now let me tell you two things that Jesus did not do. Because this is very important. Number one, Jesus did not get up and look at the storm and turn to his disciples and say, all right, who sinned? (laughs) Jesus did not assume that somebody had sinned and thereby causing the storm. And can I tell you something else Jesus didn't do? This to me is very, very interesting. Jesus did not get up and look at the storm and say, well, guys... I guess God is trying to teach us something. So we should passively sit here because this obviously is God's will because whatever, whatever happens is God's will, right? That's what some people believe. And so Jesus, if he had believed that, he would have thought that, well, if there's a storm, then it must be from God and he must be trying to teach us something So let's hold hands and sing que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see, que sera, sera. If you're my age or older, do not get your theology from the Doris Day show. Jesus didn't assume that one of his team members had sinned, nor did Jesus assume that they were to passively submit to this storm. Jesus got up and rebuked it. So he must have believed that this was some kind of spiritual attack as well as a natural problem. But, but at whatever rate, he, he took spiritual authority over it. Now, what's interesting is that when you look at storms in the Bible... What you need to understand is the storm is not the main issue. The main issue is the destination. The point of the storm of Jonah was not the fish and not the storm. It was Nineveh. The point of this story in Mark chapter 4 was not the storm. It was what was at the other side. Now, you know what was at the other side? the madman of Gadara. A demon-possessed man that cut himself, was, lived a life of absolute torment, and Jesus was going to set him free. You think that might be why that storm arose? Jesus had just taught them that Satan comes for the word's sake. And I want you to know, I want you to understand this, that when you as a believer take a stand on the Word of God, you become a threat to the enemy. He'll fight to get you to quit believing the Bible, to get get you to quit believing the Word of God. We had one student in Bible school several years ago who said that, He said, you know, I never really was serious about the Bible until I got to Bible school, which you don't have to wait until you get to Bible school. You can be serious about the Bible right now. But just in his case, that was the the case. And he said, you know, I was really never serious about the Bible. And and because I was never serious about the Bible, he said, I really didn't know anything about spiritual attacks. But he said, once I started getting into the Bible, he said, I began to face spiritual opposition. He said, I went to the class Christ the Healer. And he said, I started getting so excited about healing. And he said, and I got attacked with sickness. And he said, then I went to the class on God's laws of giving and prosperity. And and he said, I started getting excited about giving and prosperity. And he said, and I went broke. So then I went to the class on fasting and I gained 10 pounds. (laughs) Now, I don't think that was a spiritual attack. I think that was an out of control fork, but... 
can I tell you something? Satan doesn't care about a church that's not winning souls. Satan doesn't care about a church that is just going through the motions of religious services and things like that. Did you show me a church that's excited about rescuing souls from hell? You show me a church that wants to get people born again and spirit-filled and devoted followers of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and create a mindset of missionary within every member where they understand that we are the light of the world. We are a city set on a hill. We're going to set the captives free. And there will be some storms. Jonah got into his storm because of? He got out of his storm through? Jo uh, the disciples got into their storm in the midst of? Perfect obedience. And they got out of their storm through spiritual authority. Let me take you to a third storm, Acts chapter 27. One size doesn't fit all. The Apostle Paul, my hero. By this time, Paul was a prisoner. Guess why Paul got arrested? Wasn't jaywalking. He got arrested for preaching the gospel. Still happening in the world today, many nations. Paul knew that he wasn't going to get a fair trial in Israel because of some of the religious prejudices against him. And so because he was not only Jewish, but he was also a Roman citizen, he appealed to Caesar. He appealed to the secular court system of the land. And when he appealed to Caesar, it became the responsibility of the Roman authorities to transport him from where he was in originally Jerusalem, then later Caesarea, became their responsibility to transport him to Rome to stand before Caesar. And so the way you did that back then was you got on a boat and began sailing west. Well, they made it as far as the island of Crete. And they're, they're stopped in Crete and they're kind of debating, should we go on? It's winter time. Should we keep sailing? Should we stay here? And I want you to see what happens in Acts chapter 27, verse 9. It's very, very interesting. Now, remember, Paul is a preacher and a prisoner. He is not a mariner or a meteorologist. But it says in Acts 27, 9, but Paul advised them saying, men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss not only of the cargo and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion, the guy in charge, was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised. Everybody say the majority. majority. Everybody else wanted to do it except Paul. Now, why do you think Paul perceived that the voyage was going to end with disaster? We said he wasn't a mariner, he wasn't a sailor, he wasn't a meteorologist. Why, why would Paul have perceived danger ahead? Because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will show you things to come. Paul had a witness in his spirit. Guys, this is not right. This is not the direction to go. He had a conviction from the Holy Spirit in his heart. But because he was a prisoner, he didn't have any rights. And so everybody else said what they wanted to, and the majority prevailed. You know what happened? They sailed right into a storm. And it was a storm the Bible describes as being of typhoon strength. And it blew them around the Mediterranean, which is a huge body of water, for 14 days. Now, Dan, here's where I'm going to bring up our recent trip. We were just in Turkey. We sailed from the coast near Ephesus out to the island of Patmos. It was a four-hour boat ride. 
Everybody say four hours. Four hours. We had very rough seas. This was a week and a half ago. In four hours on that boat, half of our group, yours truly included, was looking at the ocean, the sea. Do you get my drift? I told one of our group that it reminded me of an Old Testament trip because there were so many heave offerings <laughs> being made. After throwing up three times, I went and laid down on a bench and I just said, don't touch me, don't talk to me. And I just laid there. And I'm sitting there, that's, this is four hours. Paul was on this ship for 14 days. Horrible, disastrous conditions. 14 days. And I want you to read what happened here. Acts chapter 27, verse 20. How many of you have ever had a situation where the answer didn't come as quickly as you would have liked? How many of you would like me to tell you tonight how to never have a prolonged situation, but how to always get an immediate answer? How many of you would like me to tell you that? I'd love to know. I wish I knew I'd, I'd <laughs> tell you and we'd all be happy. And then I'd pray for you that we'd all have a trouble-free life. But Acts chapter 27 verse 20 says, When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. But after long abstinence from food, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there was long abstinence from food. Nobody felt like eating. Then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me. What's that translate to today? I told you so. You should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. Uh, and now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for it sh I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. You know, that angel didn't show up the first day of the storm. Angel didn't show up the second day of the storm. I don't know why this thing was protracted. I don't know why this thing took longer. But I'll tell you what, when the angel said, don't be afraid, Paul, you know, I'm sure circumstantially that was a... You know, the Bible says that, you know, everybody on that ship had given up hope. You know, maybe Paul, I, I don't know if he was dealing with fear, if that's why the angel said, Paul, don't be afraid. But I'll tell you one thing. I can't imagine that Paul didn't wrestle with the temptation to be so angry at the people who put him in that position. See, Jonah got into his storm because of disobedience. The disciples got into their storm in the midst of perfect obedience, but Paul got into his storm because of the disobedience of other people. And man, how many people in life have been hurt? Because somebody else did something stupid. Because somebody else did something sinful. Because somebody else did something selfish. I, Paul, you know, I mean, if he's human, I, he was, obviously. But I, I think I would have really wrestled with not only being angry at those people, why didn't you listen to me? And I have suffered because of you. But I think Paul could have been angry at God. God, I've served you all these years. And he, but you know what? What other people do can have an effect on our life. But that's why I believe it's so powerful when that angel said, God has granted you all those who sail with you. It appears to me that Paul was praying for them. He's saying, God, this ship is full of lost people, 
If they drown, they're going to hell. God, save them. You know, let them live longer so they have more of a chance to, to know you. He was praying for them. See, he wasn't, he wasn't wallowing in self-pity, in selfishness. He was seeing them as people that were in need of God's mercy, God's forgiveness, and God's help. Paul got out of his storm simply through perseverance. He persevered in faith. I wish faith was always instantaneous. Man, I wish I knew how to make it happen instantly for everybody. But I found there sometimes... And see, even Jesus didn't, didn't make every storm stop instantly. Did you know there was one storm where he just walked on top of the water? Why didn't he make that storm stop? I don't know why he didn't. But I do know this, there's three different kinds of storms in the Bible. And there's three different ways that people got out of it. Paul got into his storm because of the disobedience of others. He got out of it through perseverance. But what I really believe is that the big thing of these stories is not the storms, but the destinations. Jonah made it to Nineveh. The disciples and Jesus made it to the other side. Paul made it to Rome. And in every case, there was an explosion and an expression of the mercy and the kindness of God. I want you to know, for Rock Church, you have a destination. It's not, I'm not talking about a geographical destination. I'm talking about a place in God, a place of accomplishment, a place of productivity, a place of fruitfulness where God wants you to go. And I want you to know that for each one of you individually, God has a destination for you to become the person that God has called you to be and to do the things that God has called you to accomplish. I had a lady one time come to me after I shared this message at a church and she said, Brother Cook, what do you do when you're in all three storms at once? She said, because there's one area of my life, she said, I'm like Jonah. I was running away from God. I made some stupid decisions. And I'm still dealing with the consequences. She said, Tony, there's another area where I'm like the disciples. I was endeavoring to obey Jesus. I was endeavoring to do what God wanted me to do. And it seemed like all hell broke loose. You know, spiritual opposition to keep me from continuing to obey God. And she said, and Tony, there's a third area where uh, another person close to me made a decision. She said, I'm like Paul. Somebody else made a, a bad decision and it's affecting me. He says, what do you do when you're in all three storms at once? I said, man, the only thing I know to tell you is that you just need to repent like Jonah and you need to take spiritual authority like Jesus and you need to persevere like Paul. And I said, you'll make it. You'll make it to where God wants you to go. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your wonderful people here tonight. Thank you for your love, for your compassion for each and every one of us. And Father, if there be people here tonight that their relationship with you is not what it should be, I thank you right now for speaking to each and every heart by the power of your Spirit. Father, I'm so thankful that you love me enough that even when I had sinned and come short of your standard, that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for me so that my sins could be forgiven. And Lord, I thank you, Jesus, that you died not just for me, but you died for every person in this place tonight. And I want you to know, I'm speaking to you now. I'm not talking to God. I'm talking to you right now. If you're in this place tonight, and if your heart were to stop beating tonight, do you know, do you have the absolute confidence, the absolute assurance that you are, number one, you're a child of God, and that number two, you're going to be in heaven? See, there was a time when I was growing up, I grew up in church, and I believed in God in my head, but if you said, Tony, if you were to die right now, do you know for sure that you'd go to heaven? The only honest answer I could have given was, well, I hope so. And the reason I didn't have any confidence, the reason I didn't have any assurance is because even though I said I believed in God, and even though I said I believed in Jesus, the truth of the matter was, I was trusting in myself. I was hoping that I had been good enough, that I had done enough good things, that I had gone to church enough. Listen, let me tell you this because I love you. 
you can't earn your way to heaven by doing good things or, or doing good works or going to church enough. All those things are great and wonderful, but the Bible doesn't say you can be good enough to make it to heaven or you can be perfect enough or religious enough. Heaven's not for good or perfect or religious people. Heaven is for one type of person and one type of person only, and that is forgiven people. And there's only one way that God made for us to be forgiven, and that's when he sent his son Jesus Christ to the cross. And Jesus died and shed his blood and rose from the dead, and he is alive right now offering every single person here the gift of eternal life. And if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus, I, I just want you to know that God is offering you the greatest gift, the greatest expression of his love and mercy in offering you a brand new start. Jesus said you must be born again. Maybe you're here tonight and maybe you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. I'm not talking about just thinking about God or believing in God mentally. I'm talking about you giving all of your life and all of your heart to God. Not talking about being a lukewarm, half in, half out type Christian. Talking about being completely sold out to God. And maybe there's some people here tonight that you gave your life to God at one time, but you've been running away from God. You're like Jonah. God told you to do something and you've been running away from God. I'm not talking about just some little adjustment that you need to make in your attitude or something, but I mean your life is, is headed the wrong direction and you are out of the will of God. I want you to know tonight that God is inviting you. God is pleading with you, imploring you to, to be reconciled to Him. I don't want a single person in this place if your relationship with God is not what it should be, if you're not born again or if you're not uh, living fully and completely for God, I don't want you to leave this place tonight until you have that taken care of. I wonder how many people here tonight, and I'm going to ask you to, in a, just a minute, I'm going to ask you to do three very simple things. I'm going to ask you, number one, if that's you, you need to be born again, you need to get your life right with God, rededicate your life to God. I'm going to ask you to do three things. Number one, I'm just going to ask you to lift your hand and look at me in a second. Number two, I'm going to ask you to stand up when I ask everybody to stand up. And number three, I'm going to ask you to come and we're going to all have a word of prayer together because I want your life to be right with God. God wants you to be in right relationship with Him. How many all over this place on the count of three would say, Tony, I need Jesus for the very first time or I need to rededicate. I'm, I'm backslid. I'm running away from God. I need to turn around and come back home. On the count of three, let me see your hand. One, two, three. Let me see your hand all over this place. You need to get right with God today. I'm looking all over this place. Ushers, maybe help me a little bit. I'm looking everywhere. Ushers, are there hands? How many of you would say this with me? How many of you would say, Tony, I have been in the middle of a storm and it may be the Paul type of storm where you need to persevere. It may be the uh, disciples type of storm where you need to begin to take spiritual authority. We've already ruled out the Jonah. But how many of you are in some type of storm that you're dealing with and you want us just to lift that up right now? Several hands all over this place. Let's pray together. Say this with me. Say, Dear Father, I am walking after you. I'm obeying your voice. I'm here to do your will. I will not let any spiritual attack. I will not let any spiritual opposition keep me from your will for my life. I will let no attack discourage me or dishearten me. I declare that no weapon formed against me will prosper. And in the midst of my storm, God, you give me wisdom. You give me grace. You give me peace. I will not grow weary in the midst of this storm. God, I will not harbor offense against you. I will not hold unforgiveness against others. God, I put myself totally in your hands. I put my marriage totally in your hands. I put my finances totally in your hands. 
I put my children totally in your hands. And I thank you, Lord, that though I may face many afflictions, you will deliver me from them all. Not some, not most, not many, but you will deliver me from them all. Thank you, God, that you're my deliverer. You're my redeemer. You're my strength. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Pastor Dan, thank you so much. That was just a wonderful word. Tony, I just want to thank you for the wonderful word of God tonight. That was amazing. Now, before anybody gets up and leaves, because there's people running out of the place right now, with your permission, Tony and uh, Pastor Jim and Deborah, I just want to take a couple more minutes. I know we're a couple minutes more, but there's something very important that I want to talk to you about before you leave this place. Because I believe that tonight, some of you in this place missed an opportunity. Not opportunity is to give God all of your heart and all of your life. And Tony asked a very important question. If you were to die right now, would you end up in heaven or would you go to hell? And I want to make sure, just a couple more minutes and then I'll let you go. So I'm going to ask everybody, please remain seated, okay? We'll let you guys get out and get your children and, 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 and we'll, we'll dismiss you guys in a, in a couple of minutes, I promise. But I just want to make sure before you leave this place that you're right with God. Because you don't get right with God by coming to church. Don't get right with God by doing good deeds. You don't get right with God because you know something about God or carry your Bible or can sing the church songs or any of those types of things. It's not about being born in America or, or being a good person, doing enough good that you can work your way up, just like Tony described. But this is about your heart and your life. If you haven't yet given God all of your heart, if you haven't yet given God all of your life, then you're not going to make it. Jesus called it being born Again, it's not a natural thing. It's not something that you work for, something that you believe God for and that you receive. You must be born again in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And if you haven't yet done that, then tonight I want to give you that opportunity one more time. I just want to make sure because I don't want, and Tony doesn't want, you to go to hell. And most of all, God doesn't want you to go to hell. It was never intended for us. It was intended for the devil and his angels that rebelled. And it's a very real place, and we're going to have to face that reality. And so tonight, I just want to give one more opportunity in, in a moment that we have here. And I want to make sure that if you were to die tonight, that you would end up in heaven and that you wouldn't go to hell. We're loving you enough tonight. God is loving you enough tonight and pleading with you. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? I'm going to give you that opportunity one more time. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. Slap my hand on this pulpit. And if you know you need to do that, you know you missed the opportunity and you sat there and did nothing when you knew you needed to raise your hand when Tony gave the first invitation. But now you'll be honest with yourself and be honest before God and say, yeah, I know I need to do that. Just lift your hand up on the count of three. I'm going to pop my hand on this pulpit. That's your opportunity. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call. Your choice. That God is holding this whole service up to see if you'll surrender it all to Him. Give Him all of your heart. Give Him all of your life. If not, hey, we love you and we hope that you will do that sometime soon. So here we go on the count of three. If you need to do this, you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. If you're not sure about your salvation, come on tonight, make sure. If you've never done this, never been born again, never given God all your heart in life, I'm speaking to you. On the count of three all together, here we go. One, two, three. Three, let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. If you know you need to do that, you know you missed the first opportunity. Thank you right there up top. Who else tonight? You know you need to do it. Thank you. There's two right there. Who else? There's anybody else real quick? Real quick, we've got two people that said, yeah, I missed that first opportunity. I'm not going to miss it again. Thank you over here. Gotcha. Three, thank you. Up on top, I, th I think I got you already. You can put your hand down. Thank you. Four, five, thank you. God bless you. Who else tonight? Who else tonight? They're pointing over this way. If that's you, Oh, got you over there. Thank you, six. Who else tonight? You know you, I missed that opportunity. I don't want to miss this opportunity now. I, I want to go to heaven. Deny my presence in hell. Anybody else real quick? Real quick, real quick. I'm going to close this up. Don't miss this opportunity. That's you. There's six wise people already. You know you need to do this. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right. All six of you real fast. I want to do this. Let's all stand and welcome them. You come. Just come to the front right now. We want to pray with you, so just make your way to the front. Come on right now. You come right now. Lord, I give you my heart.
They're coming from the family. If you want to bring your children, bring them on down. Come on. Come quickly, come quickly, come quickly. If you're next to somebody, then raise your hand. Say, come on, friend, I'll go with you. Bring them on down. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming. You can come too. Every moment I'm away. Hallelujah. Anybody else, if you need to come, just make your way to the front. Make your way to the front right now if that's you. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Quickly, quickly, quickly. All right. Praise the Lord. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming. All right. Everybody up front, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine right over here. This is Pastor Joel waving at you. Pastor Joel is a really good guy. He's going to lead you in prayer to invite Jesus in your heart, give you some free stuff, and tell you about a program we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainer, and then he'll let you come right back out. So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel right this way, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. God is so good.